Marina Rabinovich. She is the critical care clinical pharmacy specialist at Grady Health System. She wears many hats. She's a pharmacy residency coordinator and the president of the SSCM Southeast chapter. We really look forward to her talk on vasopressors, what's hot, what's not, and what's next. Thanks, Marina. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wish I could, I mean, I hope I can make it as hot as I can, but we'll see, bear with me. Um, let me see if I find a clicker here. Okay. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and here are the objectives that I hope to help you learn uh, by the end of this talk. So even though I'm a pharmacist, um, and as hard as it is for me not to do this, but today will not be less than pharmacology, and I'm sorry to disappoint some of you. Um, today we'll mostly just talk about um, what pressors we have, what, why we use what we use, uh, what does the evidence say, what's emerging out there. Uh, we'll start by um, looking at the surviving sepsis guidelines and how they evolved over the last 10 years or so. Um, since its inception in 2002, Surviving Sepsis Campaign had published several guidelines, first one being in 2004, uh, focusing on uh, decreasing mortality from sepsis uh, by increasing awareness, improving diagnosis, uh, developing guidelines for appropriate care based on published evidence. And um, as far as vasopressors, in the, the first guideline, 2004, um, provided a relatively weak recommendation for either norepinephrine or dopamine as your initial presser of choice, uh, followed by even weaker recommendation to add vasopressin if you had um, patients with refractory shock. Um, 2008, that recommendation kind of remained to be the same for the first line presser, again, being a relatively weak recommendation um, for norepinephrine or dopamine. Um, and then really any other presser, um, you any, pick any for your second line. And we end 2016 guidelines um, with a relatively strong recommendation for, again, norepinephrine is your first line um, presser. Um, and then uh, a weaker recommendation for either vasopressin or epinephrine as your second line. And then maybe uh, dopamine if you pretty much um, sold your soul. So um, what about phenylephrine? Interestingly, if you look at the 2016 guidelines, there is really no mention of phenylephrine and where it should really be used in uh, patients with septic shock. Um, and it's pretty much um, truly based on uh, insufficient data for its use in septic shock, really. There's only maybe one randomized control trial that looked at phenylephrine versus norepinephrine and found um, no advantage of its use. And interestingly, in this uh, recently published study, some of you may remember the horrific times of 2011 when we had shortage of norepinephrine, and many hospitals had to reserve to using uh, alternative agents. So in this study, they actually authors reported um, uh, the effect of norepinephrine shortage on mortality during that time, and found that majority of hospitals, um, or the most common agent used by many hospitals was actually phenylephrine. And the decrease in norepinephrine use by 20% or more was directly associated with increased hospital mortality with an increased risk of 3.7%. So that was um, an interesting finding, um, and you know, could potentially also lead to why we don't really um, have a recommendation for phenylephrine. So um, what's our current situation? And um, pretty much based on the uh, most recent guidelines, it seems that our options are limited to catecholamines, um, such as norepinephrine or epinephrine, and maybe very, very carefully dopamine, um, and then uh, vasopressin analogs, such as uh, vasopressin. Well, how did we arrive at these recommendations, especially since there are no study to date that demonstrates a, significantly, um, a significant survival benefit of one vasopressor over the other? Um, it does um, seem that norepinephrine remains to be the front runner um, out of all the agents, but honestly, it seems like the choice of presser seems kind of empiric um, and maybe should be patient specific. Um, so to get a, a better sense of how maybe surviving sepsis campaign um, arrived at these recommendations, um, we can look at one of many meta-analyses. This one in particular was done by Gamper and colleagues um, for Cochrane Database. Um, and it was a meta-analysis of 28 studies comparing uh, various vasopressors and their effects on mortality. Um, this review was initially published in 2004 and then updated in 2011 and then most recently um, went through another update in 2016. Um, this analysis included uh, over 300, uh, sorry, 3,500 patients um, 
and uh, looked at six different vasopressors uh, alone or in combination. Uh, all 28 studies reported mortality outcomes. Um, and in summary, really, the researchers found um, no difference in total mortality in comparing um, different pressors or in combinations of pressors. Um, the majority, majority uh, comparisons were norepinephrine to the other pressors. Um, and as you can see, um, the line, the, all the horizontal lines do not cross the middle lines. So pretty much just demonstrating that no statistically significant um, difference in mortality. Looking at each uh, pressor separately, starting with dopamine, um, the SOAP2 trial with over 1,600 patients um, that were randomized to either norepinephrine or dopamine as the first line pressor. Receptive shock. The primary outcome was 28-day mortality, but they also looked at six months and 12 months mortality um, in this study, as well as length of stay and adverse effects. Um, and just again, quick review that there was no significant difference in the rate of death um, and the use of dopamine was associated with a greater number of adverse events, particularly arrhythmias, um, especially in the subgroup of patients with cardiogenic shock. Although, again, it's a more of a, a post hoc analysis with smaller number of patients, so more of a hypothesis generating um, result. And um, overall, the meta analysis included six randomized controlled trials comparing um, norepinephrine and dopamine with 1,400 patients. And again, uh, found a trend towards increased risk of death with dopamine compared to norepinephrine, as well as an increased risk of life-threatening arrhythmias. And just like that, dopamine was being pretty much phased out of the clinical practice, although it's obviously still an effective agent, um, since there was no difference compared to norepinephrine, but it provided the same type of effect. Uh, looking at epinephrine, historically, providers would typically shy away from using epinephrine, um, secondary to some of the side effects that we all uh, aware of, uh, especially after the original SOAP trial published the increased mortality in patients who received um, epinephrine. But surviving sepsis um, guidelines kind of brought it back to life. Uh, based on the data published by CAT study group determining the differences between epinephrine and norepinephrine in um, achieving MAP goals under more real life um, conditions, clinical conditions, um, they evaluated 280 patients and found no difference in the ability of either presser to achieve um, goal MAP as well as mortality. Um, as everyone expected, um, hopefully you can see this, um, there was, um, as everybody anticipated, there, there was an increase in lactate levels as well as heart rate in the epinephrine group, but um, that difference is primarily um, evident in the first few hours and really was non-existent after the first day. Um, so basically, um, did, and that did not result in any significant difference of, um, in adverse effect, events between norepinephrine and epinephrine. So again, overall, with four more randomized trials and about 540 patients comparing norepinephrine to epinephrine um, and finding no differences um, in the risk of death, um, there seems to be um, really no reason or to discriminate between norepinephrine and epinephrine for septic shock. It really seems like um, equivalent choices based on the published data. Um, recently, it seems like there have been a lot of attention paid to um, vasopressin as a potential oppressor um, based on some small studies suggesting a beneficial physiologic effect uh, on organ function, in particular renal function. However, a large randomized controlled trial of vasopressin added to norepinephrine um, and versus norepinephrine alone did not provide evidence that um, vasopressin leads to uh, better survival in patients um, with septic shock in this, uh, this study evaluated over 700 patients. Um, there, at 28 days, at least, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, closer to about 90 days, there seems to be that the um, curves do diverge more, uh, potentially suggesting that there's a trend toward, trend toward lower mortality in vasopressin group. But at that point, they had um, too small of a number of patients to find a difference. They also did not find a difference in um, length of stay or any adverse events. Um, they did have some interesting subgroup results in this trial, first being the, in the predefined group of less severe shock, which would define, was defined by norepinephrine requirements of less than 15 mics per minute. There was a reduced mortality when patients received vasopressin. Um, also, they found that vasopressin might be more effective in preventing deterioration in renal function as opposed to preventing AKI um, up from the start. And then vasopressin... They also found that this interaction of vasopressin and steroids leading to lower mortality compared to norepinephrine and steroids. 
Uh, when they examined that interaction closer in the follow-up trial, they did confirm um, lower mortality. Um, when uh, lower mortality in vasopressin and steroid group, that's the graph on the top, um, compared to the norepinephrine and steroid group, um, and quite the opposite effect um, if the steroids were not used. So the graph on the bottom, there was actually um, higher mortality in the vasopressin group when the steroids were not used. Um, another interesting finding is that they found that steroids significantly increased vasopressin levels at um, 6 and 24 hours, um, as shown by the black line on the top there. And then there was no change in vasopressin uh, levels at all um, in the norepinephrine group, and those, uh, those are the two lines um, at the bottom of the graph. <clears throat> so, and then when exploring the early vasopressin use as initial pressor and its effects on kidney function, compared to norepinephrine, with or without, without steroids, author, authors also found, um, of the Benish study, found no difference um, in the kidney function um, rate or mortality. Although they did use um, somewhat atypical doses, they used pretty low doses of norepinephrine, the max dose was 12 mics per minute, and pretty high doses of vasopressin of 0.06 units per, uh, per minute, so which are not typical doses that we use in practice. Um, the only significant outcome was renal replacement therapy, which was lower in vasopressin group. And, but overall conclusion from this study was that vasopressin offers no benefit over norepinephrine in septic shock. Um, information from eight randomized controlled trials and over 1,100 patients comparing norepinephrine, vasopressin, uh, moderate level of evidence, pretty much does not support the routine use of vasopressin. Um, it's costly, but guess what? We still use it, right? Um, I'd say probably majority of patient of providers um, do um, believe in the norepinephrine sparing effect of vasopressin, and um, so it's still used in practice um, quite a bit for patients in refractory shock. So what does that leave us with? Um, the big picture is not so hot, I tried, but um, I would just, would just recall that norepinephrine remains um, pretty much the front runner for um, your vasopressors, um, maybe with epinephrine and vasopressin at their side, um, but it, you know, I'm not sure if that's enough. And of course, um, people probably would want to have more options, maybe with different mechanism of actions. Um, and because we know that maybe using too much of one thing is not really that good. We, uh, there's plenty of evidence um, uh, to demonstrate that using high doses of catecholamines for long, for long periods of time can cause um, significant cardiac dysfunction. Um, and other um, organ dysfunction. So luckily for us, there are a couple therapies that are being um, investigated, um, and then we'll, we'll talk, spend a couple more minutes talking about those. So what's new out there? Celeprosin, um, which is a vasopressin analog. Um, unlike vasopressin, it's a V1 selective agonist. Um, vasopressin also activates V2 receptors as well as oxytocin receptors and um, um, other, and to name a few. So besides just um, causing direct vasoconstriction, um, uh, vasopressin also uh, increases uh, blood volume due to decreased water clearance, um, as well as potentially can contribute to microvascular thrombosis. Um, celepressin um, is thought not, um, not to have those uh, side effects um, since it's only a V1 selective agonist. And compared, in so far only animal data, comparing it to vasopressin and norepinephrine, celepressin suggests um, lower mortality, less lung edema, improved urine output, and free water clearance, as well as less vascular leak. Um, in a recently published trial in critical care medicine, um, celepressin compared to uh, vasopressin here was associated with um, better water clearance, uh, as evident by um, uh, decreased fluid balance, um, as well as less lung edema, and this was done in septic um, uh, animals. Um, so, Currently, Fearing Pharmaceuticals is actually conducting patient enrollment um, for a phase 2B3 um, uh, study. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, um, obviously randomized trial um, that aims to um, assess safety and efficacy of celepressin at multiple dose regimens. Um, this will be conducted at 50 to 60 sites in Europe and U.S. Um, they aim to enroll about 1,800 patients um, with the primary outcome looking at vasopressor and mechanical ventilator free days. And the intent of this primary outcome is to really um, show off the um, speed of recovery from um, septic shock and the respiratory failure. 
um, using this agent. Um, the aim is to complete the study in the next couple of, day, uh, couple of years, so stay tuned for that. Um, what else is new, or maybe old, in Gen Tencent 2 um, is uh, it's not a new um, uh, agent, really, or therapy. It was first described in 1960s in case reports and animal studies as a potential um, choice, uh, vasopressor choice in patients with refractory shock. Uh, but because of heterogeneity of published reports, um, case reports, not really well-designed de uh, well studies, um, it never really gained any traction. Um, and Gentensin 2 is basically a product of um, running um, a Gentensin aldosterone system, the RAS, which is activated in response to hypotension and hypovolemia seen in septic shock. Um, this indu in induces the release of renin from the juxtaglomerular cells of the renal um, afferent arterioles. Let me see if I can, in this right here, um, which then stimulates the production of angiotensin 1, which has pretty poor biologic activity. And then it's converted to angiotensin 2 uh, by the angiotensin converting enzyme, primarily found um, expressed in the lungs, but also found in other organs. And then angiotensin 2 um, goes on to activate. Um, several receptors and produce various effects such as vasoconstriction, aldosterone, secretion, vasopressin release. Um, so because um, one of the theories behind the role of angiotensin 2 is the fact that angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE is primarily like I said, expressed in pulmonary microcirculation and in patients with septic shock commonly they also um, develop acute lung injury and the thought is that if they have, um, they lose the ability of, um, to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 due to loss of ACE, then you potentially may have some angiotensin 2 deficiency and refractory shock, um, catecholamine dependent shock. Another um, theory behind the role of angiotensin 2 is the theory of septic kidney. Um, since renal blood flow is uh, highly dependent on systemic pressures, um, it's important to look at what happens at the renal vasculature. Um, in hyperdynamic shock, there is increase in cardiac output um, and increase in uh, renal blood flow. But because there's systemic hypotension along with afferent and efferent um, arterial vasodilation, there's actually a decrease in glomerular filtration rate and, um, and uh, there's in, uh, which causes intraglomerular hypotension. So um, basically, which then, if not result, will lead to kidney dysfunction over time. So when it comes um, to kidney glomerular, so we kind of know that um, catecholamines such as norepinephrine and then potentially even vasopressin will cause vasoconstriction at the afferent side um, while angiotensin and then that potentially causing the vasoconstriction at the afferent side will lead to decreased renal blood flow through the glomerulus and then um, angiotensin 2 will actually cause vasoconstriction at the efferent side maintaining that intraglomerular pressure. Um, and similar effect is seen at the capillary level uh, where uh, pressors like norepinephrine or vasopressin may cause vasoconstriction at the precapillary sphincter and de-recruit that capillary versus um, angiotensin II by causing vasoconstriction at the, uh, the post-capillary uh, sphincter can maintain that capillary pressure. Um, now, I guess this is the theory, and of course, too much of one thing could still lead to um, negative outcomes, so too much of angiotensin II could potentially lead to organ dysfunction due to excessive vasoconstriction at the post-capillary um, sphincter or efferent um, arterial, so um, in finding the right dose is important. Um, outside of animal data and clinical report, uh, case reports, the most um, clinical data we have for the use of angiotensin II in septic shock is this pilot study, the ATHOS trial, that um, looked at 20 patients um, who received uh, low doses of angiotensin. Um, and here in the study, they found um, so the patients were randomized to receive either angiotensin or placebo, plus the standard of care, um, which was um, norepinephrine and either vasopressin or epinephrine. And um, if you can see here on this graph, angiotensin 2 resulted in 65% decrease in norepinephrine dose. Um, and as angiotensin dose decreased, norepinephrine dose increased. Um, so this potentially um, gave some... Um, promise that angiotensin might be uh, an option as a rescue vasopressor for catecholamine-dependent shock. They did have two patients who um, had a, a, um, a much more 
um, significant response to angiotensin II with a significant hypertension in those two patients who are um, also in RDS, and that's how they um, also were able to conclude that maybe um, due to the last loss of um, ACE activity in patients with ARDS, um, due to pulmonary capillary and endothelium damage, angiotensin II might be more beneficial in those patients. <clears throat> so luckily for us, there is a phase three study um, f with angiotensin um, for catecholamine re uh, resistant hypertension that's um, just been completed this past month. Um, the results are not available yet, at least I couldn't find them, uh, but it's, um, it's a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled multi-site trial looking at 344 patients, um, with, like I said, with a catecholamine-dependent um, shock and um, uh, receiving um, angiotensin. Some of the notable exclusion criteria included burn patients, ac patients on ACMO, patients with liver failure, acute coronary syndrome, or asthma. Um, they administered um, angiotensin II in a titratable fashion to find a goal map, achieve a goal map of 75 at three hours. Um, they also were able to receive standard of care vasopressors. And the primary outcome they looked for is the primary is increase in uh, mean arterial pressure at three hours to greater than 75 or at least a 10 millimeter mercury increase from baseline. They also looked at change in SOFA score at 48 hours, mortality at seven and 28 days, and change in vasopressor rate or the heart rate. Some of the subgroup analyses um, that they um, included uh, were um, patients who had recent exposure to ACE um, inhibitors or ARBs, uh, patients in the RDS, and um, also looking at baseline angiotensin one and angiotensin two um, levels. Um, so in summary, so I, I feel like evidence is insufficient to prove that any one presser it assessed dose um, is superior over other in terms of mortality. Um, I mean, maybe mortality is not what we should be looking at. Maybe we should be looking at how fast can you know um, we get to goal blood pressure and uh, maintain that blood pressure to maintain perfusion or, um, and so on. So maybe more the newer data should be coming out focusing on those things as we've seen already. Um, most available data does involve norepinephrine, but the choice of specific presser may need to be individualized really on the patient's, based on patient's response the, um, to the um, agent that they're on, the side effects, the drug interactions, um, the cost and the availability, all those things have to play into a role. So it's kind of hard to state, um, for me to say, this should be first line, this should be second line, and this should be third line. I really feel like those need to be individualized like all other care as well. And that concludes my talk, and um, I'd love to welcome any questions.